how can I possibly stand here today in front of you and talk about my beautiful three-year-old daughter's long battle with cancer, at the same time express my tremendous sense of gratitude? How does that even begin to add up? If you'll come with me today on a journey with my family, I hope to show you that gratitude is a key skill to dealing with a crisis. One thing I've learned on this journey is that every human being has a story. Every human being faces crisis. Every human being faces challenges in their lives. And today I hope to help you with yours. We were living in Spain when Chelsea had her first nasty fever. We saw a doctor, it went away. At the time, we were planning our next move to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, where Angie, my wife in rock, was planning to go back to teaching after bringing up the girls who were now two and three years old. We thought we had everything planned out. We were very practiced travelers, having had the good fortune to have lived and worked in nine countries on four continents, Angie as a primary school teacher, and myself as a financial futures and options trader at some of the world's leading financial institutions in Hong Kong and in the city of London, and at the time as an independent. About two months into our Malaysian adventure, we decided to take a long weekend to a small island offshore. Angie and I shared a love of scuba diving. I'd been an instructor in the past, and our little girls were absolute fish in the water. But not Chelsea this time. Chelsea got rapidly and seriously ill. There was one doctor on the island, saw her, and we headed home to Kuala Lumpur as quickly as we could, clutching our listless little girl in our arms and a tiny, open local boat. And when we finally got to Kuala Lumpur, Angie took Chelsea straight to a pediatrician. Blood work was taken. And very shortly, they called us back. They said the numbers were hard to believe. Something was wrong. Chelsea had her first emergency blood transfusion that evening. And I then had to watch as Angie and Chelsea disappeared off into the busy Kuala Lumpur traffic in an ambulance, sirens blaring. To a hospital, although we didn't know it at the time, a hospital with a pediatric oncology department. We were sitting next to Chelsea's hospital bed in the ward when the team of doctors and nurses came in and told us that just a week short of her third birthday, our beautiful three-year-old little girl had been diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And her world and our worlds were completely turned upside down. We began our new lives at the Pediatric Oncology Ward, a place where we met so many heroes. It's difficult to adequately describe to you how tough that first year in Malaysia was. We lived day by day and moment to moment. In total, Chelsea faced almost three years of daily chemotherapy, sometimes into her spine and directly up into her brain, and at other times through the surgically implanted port in her chest and the line that went inside her heart. We faced multiple crises, surgeries, and life-threatening infections, in one case, having to have last-ditch antibiotics flown out from America to help. Even when you're not in hospital, and there are countless long nights in hospital, as a parent, the fear never really leaves you alone. Common everyday occurrences, such as someone sneezing nearby, can be scary and destabilizing. Vaccination rates were low. Herd immunity wasn't quite there, and we were absolutely terrified of measles. Chelsea had to be a very, very brave girl for a very, very long time, and how she was. We're so lucky that Chelsea is a naturally happy little girl, and even in the hard parts of which there were many, she always tried to have a smile for us. Just a super kid. Angie and I did most of the crying for her. As many of you probably know, leukemia was until quite recently 100% fatal. All the children died. I think about that a lot. We're so grateful for our little girl's inspiring life. And that gratitude for the goodness of humanity and the richness of life, we've always held that. It's never faltered. Gratitude for science, so important today. Gratitude for doctors like the 72-year-old Dr. Lin in Malaysia, who certainly saved our little girl's life, and who had so many patients and responsibilities, he simply couldn't bring himself to retire. Gratitude for nurses, so many amazing nurses, 
and for brave parents before us and brave kids who'd been in trials as we elected to be in a trial ourselves so the future could be better. Gratitude for the people who funded those trials so that little boys and girls have a really good shot at surviving that awful disease. Today, five out of six kids survive leukemia, but there's much to do. Gratitude is a key skill to dealing with crisis because it grounds you mentally. There's really no sense in asking, why us? Why our little girl? Or getting angry or depressed because it doesn't help. And that gratitude to all those amazing people who are helping you starts to drive a sense of responsibility, at first to yourself, to get your own house in order, because it's your job to be the best possible advocate that you can be for your child. I practiced yoga in the hospital ward while Chelsea slept, but you have to have a good, long, hard look at yourself. For me, I stopped drinking alcohol then and there and have never drunk since. It had always been an unhealthy habit for me personally that I'd had to watch and control, and there was simply no room for it anymore. But our gratitude went beyond the global science community and the amazing leukemia protocols that developed in America and spread hope to every corner of the globe. Gratitude to our global community of friends and family and strangers. At first, hundreds of postcards began to roll in. And then we heard of head shaves in Hong Kong, triathlons in Hong Kong, fundraisers in Singapore, a polar bear swim in Gibraltar. The volleyball community in Spain joined in. Angie's teachers, teaching colleagues in Malaysia all took part. There was a 400-foot chimney abseiled in the United Kingdom, and lemonade stands and bake sales, and in Canada, garage sales, and even a teenage violinist busking. But most of all, the love of our family, our parents who dropped everything and flew out to help. As we spent our first Christmas in hospital in Malaysia, A large group of carol singers, strangers all, came to our house when we got home to sing Jingle Bells for Chelsea. Our taxi driver, Ravi, who ferried us backwards and forwards to the hospital so often, brought us a package of ashes from the Hindu temple following his wife's prayers to put under the hospital bed. So many people from so many different walks of life and cultures came together to support our little girl. Meanwhile, back on Vancouver Island in Canada, where we hoped to move and where my wife grew up, A huge event was taking place called the Tour de Roc. Teams of police officers and firefighters and paramedics were riding bicycles huge distances for kids with cancer. We got hold of newspaper articles and photographs of the riders and we put them all over our fridge. We talked to the girls about what they were doing and where we hoped to move one day. When we did finally get to Canada, we still had 18 months of daily chemotherapy ahead of us, and Angie and I both cried when we first came to Children's Hospital in BC and saw the absolutely incredible facilities now available to us. And the Tour de Roc came to Chelsea's school for the very first time that year. I can still see it now so vividly, almost in slow motion. The whole school out around my family supporting us, and then we heard the sirens And the riders came in, 20 of them together on their bicycles, and then this huge support column of hope came into the school. And I can remember so clearly thinking, wow, this huge event, all these amazing people, they're here for our little girl. They're here for our family. It was humbling, and it was wonderful, and it was overwhelming all at once. And I looked over to my right and I saw Chelsea, happy as a peach, holding hands with Ryder Raccoon, the tour mascot, and both of our girls ecstatic for their first ride in a police car. A couple of days later, we caught up with the tour for breakfast, and the riders at this point, who'd probably done five or six hundred kilometers of their tour, got to follow the girls who led the morning warm-up. Watching the girls perform a complicated and totally random routine of high kicks and star jumps and even the splits, while those devoted police officers and firefighters did their best to keep up, was absolutely hilarious and just pure gold for our family. The Tour de Roc also funds Camp Good Times, which is a magical place where kids battling cancer and bereaved siblings can go and just be kids again with their families for a few days. It was the best time our family had had in years. 
And as we got stronger, good things began to happen. I got to see Chelsea suddenly burst into a sprint for the first time in her life, the first time I saw her run age five. You can imagine the joy of that for a parent. And as we got stronger, that sense of gratitude that we felt became more of a sense of responsibility, not just to ourselves, but to the wider community to give back, to be a small cog in that process of progress that had been going for so long, so that other little boys and girls didn't have to go through the awful things that our little girl went through, because childhood cancer is hell. It was at Camp Good Times that I met Elizabeth. Her family was next door to ours. She was a beautiful little three-year-old girl battling with cancer. But her prognosis was very poor. Cancer had spread and she had recently gone blind. I talked to her in the mornings. One day she gave me a hug. And her father, who knew we'd had treatment overseas and was desperate, came to me one evening and asked if I knew of any hope for treatment for his little girl anywhere in the world. What can you possibly say to a man like that? I felt guilty that we were the lucky ones, and I felt powerless to help. So I resolved to start making speeches to raise awareness. And in 2019, the year my father died from lung cancer, it was the honor of my life to ride, to be invited to ride in the Tour de Rock alongside 12 police officers, three firefighters, two paramedics, one deputy government minister, and a television journalist. And together, we trained hard for eight months, three days a week. And we rode almost 4,500 kilometers in training, including 1,087 kilometers for the tour itself. We visited families in crisis and in treatment. We brought hope to them and support. We attended weekly fundraisers as well, and I simply cannot say enough about these first responders who would often be working night shift on a Saturday and then come out for a six-hour training, training ride on a Sunday. They taught me so much about life, about meaning, about service, about integrity, about giving. And as we made our way down the island together in 2019, I imagined other families who were hearing the sirens and seeing us come in and feeling the support that we once did when the tour first came to Chelsea School that day. Some of the smaller communities on the island were in economic crisis in the north when we came to them. The mills had shut down, and they hosted us, fed us, and lined the streets to see us off. You can be so proud to be part of a culture that looks after its children in such a powerful way. In 2019, our team raised $1.3 million for pediatric cancer research and Camp Good Times. But just because COVID's here now, it doesn't mean that cancer's gone away. Matter of fact, it's a good deal scarier, and new teams were unable to gather and train for the Tour de Rock in the last two years. Sponsors were struggling, and we couldn't really hold fundraisers, so alumni riders got together, 40 of us, myself included, and we rode down the island in little bubbles together and passed the baton off to each other as we went down. And in the last two years, we raised another million, over a million dollars for pediatric cancer research. So proud to do something positive during COVID. I'm pleased to let you know that Chelsea, who's sitting in the middle there in my tour jersey, is now a happy, healthy 10-year-old girl, donating her hair for the second time since it grew back flanked by her amazing sister Sophie and her cousin Ella. Chelsea's now become a small leader in her own community, showing her peers the way forward, giving back. If there's one thing I'd like to leave you with tonight, it's this. Practice gratitude. Find something bigger than yourselves. Aim high and work hard. Pick up a heavy load. Shoulder your responsibilities, because that's where you will find fulfillment. That's where you'll find happiness. That's where you'll find meaning in life, and that's how you'll be able to leave the world a better place. It's been my absolute privilege to talk to you tonight, and I wish you all the very best on your journeys. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Thank you.